Hey, what is going on, everybody? Welcome to Upkick MMA, episode 227. I am Brendan. UFC Fight Night, what was supposed to be Krylov versus Span, not Krylov versus Span. Andre Muniz steps in uh, against Brendan Allen. They step up. They were already slated to be the co-main event, so that just becomes the main event. It doesn't change into a five-rounder, which I thought was slightly weird, but I guess because it was the night of the fight, that's the way it goes. Doesn't matter. Anyway, we're going to cover the main card here, the main event. We're going to cover the prelims in the next video. Uh, hopefully get to Bellator this weekend. Uh, if you're looking for 1FC, I covered that in my last video. Real quick, I do two or three videos every single week covering all these different fights down. I do breakdowns. I appreciate it if you subscribe. It'll let you know when the next video is coming out. Let's get started. Okay, uh, Brendan Allen defeating Andre Muniz. <clears throat> Uh, in the third round here, great fight. It, it, by the way, uh, if you're looking for timestamps or if you're looking for a specific fight, there are timestamps down below. So uh, real quick, I'll lay out my bias out front. I'm a fan of Brandon Allen, not only of his fight style, but we have the same first name. It's not a common first name, especially in athletics. Don't got a lot of people to root for here. Okay, guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a, I, I don't know what it is. It's a person. I'm just laying out my bias. If you can say it's stupid. I agree with you. I don't think it's an intelligent thing to have. It's just something in my brain. It just clicks. So until he does something horrific or stupid, asinine, something I really disagree with, I'm a fan of his. All right, there we go. That's my bias up front. That being said, let's get into how I scored it. <laughs> uh, they traded late kicks to start, uh, which is... I don't even know if I need to write that anymore. Can, may, should I just skip that from now on? <laughs> should I just skip it? Because, it, dude, hard low kick to start. Um, oh, that was started with that back and forth, the same low kicks. Yeah, okay. So three of the four main fights on this main card started with low kicks. And if you go back to the 1FC video I did, if you go back to the UFC video I did, the Bellator video, all of them, it doesn't matter. Leg kick, leg kick, leg kick. Everybody's doing leg kicks. I'm not against it. I don't think it's stupid. I think it's a very effective technique. I just think, like I've said before, it's become so ubiquitous that when I say the fight started with the guys trading low kicks, it's kind of stupid. <laughs> All right. Uh, straight right hand from Allen wobbled Muniz just for a moment. It was uh, hard enough that on the replay you could tell that he landed that shot and it wobbled him slightly. Uh, Muniz with a really good one-two combo. There was a pretty close round, but I felt like Muniz landed more and did more damage throughout. So I guess he didn't land more. If you look at the scorecard here, or if you look at the uh, the stats, Brendan Allen actually outlanded him 19-16. to 16. That's not how I felt watching it live. I felt like Muniz landed more, but I bet you even on the total strikes he didn't land more. Nope, because everything was a significant strike. I, I was off. And that's weird, right? Because I stated my bias up front. I'm a friend or a friend. I am not a friend. I do not know Brendan Allen at all. He know, does not know I exist. But uh, I'm a fan of Brendan Allen's, right? So you would figure I'd be watching what he does and more intently and scoring it more often, right? But that's not how I saw it. I actually thought Muniz landed more in that first round. I gave him that first round. I felt like he did more damage. But looking at the stats here, I guess I was wrong. So maybe Brendan Allen did win that first round. OK, uh, I still felt like he did a lot of damage. Was it the low kicks? Head body. No, nah, he just landed more in all areas. I couldn't tell you guys. Sorry. Maybe I just thought one of the a couple of the shots that Allen landed weren't as significant. So watching it live, that's how I scored it. That's how I scored. It. Oh, God, focus. Focus on the mic every time. All right, uh, Brendan was waiting a lot. This was the second round, so Brendan was waiting a lot. Muniz was able to land, um, even if some of them are deflected. Allen was pressuring him against the cage and staying in the pocket, and he landed some good shots, and he extended his combination. Muniz went for a takedown, and Allen used it. Uh, he had an overhook, and he used it to sweep and land on top. It was beautiful. That was a great sweep, fantastic to watch. Brendan landed some really good ground and pound and used the pressure to get to side control. Once he got to side control, he uh he just looked like he was in uh like in his element down there and Muniz is a a deadly submission artist so to see him on the bottom not being able to control anything uh, I mean 
it, I think it speaks to Allen's ability, right? I don't think we're, I'm not going to sit here and denigrate Muniz. If you watch, if you, if you've heard me say it before, I said, I actually went off on a tangent in my last video about not bringing down or talking down your opponent, talking them both uh, the loser or the winner in this case, because I'm not fighting them, but not talking one or one or the other down, talking them both up. Uh, I think it elevates the fighters. In this case, Brendan Allen being able to dominate Muniz on the ground like this really speaks to how good Brendan has become on the ground. Okay, uh, As far as the significant strikes go, it went 12 to 11 in favor of Allen. You should look at the control time. Two minutes and 44 seconds of control time. Obviously, his round, I had it 19 to 19. Muniz running him down and landing some great combos. Allen was only landing one or two shots at a time here in this last round. In fact, Muniz outlanded him in this last round, 16 to 11. But uh, Brendan caught a kick, lift the leg, and slammed him down. He uh, right into side control this time. Then he uh, <clears throat> he gets the mount. He attempts an arm triangle. He ends up riding him as Muniz rolls underneath him, takes the back, and gets the fucking rear naked choke. He cinches it up, squeezes hard, and chokes him. Chokes him out. It was beautiful. All right. Uh, I do want to look at the rankings here because I don't think Brendan Allen was ranked. He's not. But Andre Muniz was. So I don't know if this necessarily drops Muniz out of the rankings. I don't know if that's fair to him because he did step up, I guess, on a little bit of a short notice to take this fight. So... Maybe he doesn't drop out, but uh, Brandon called out uh, Drikas Duplessis. He called out Jack Hermanson. He called out Chris Curtis and also uh, Sean Strickland. So I don't think he's going to get to fight strong Sean Strickland. That's a huge jump. Uh, that would put him in a position for a title eliminator if he got that up, an impressive win over Sean Strickland. I am not being hyperbolic. A win over Chris Curtis could be possible. You know, that would be a rematch, but I find it unlikely and it doesn't make sense for either fighter right now. I think a, uh, let's see, plus he's fight. Uh, yeah, Chris Curtis is fighting Calvin Cass, uh, Gaslam, which is, which is, which is good. Cause that means they're going to be fighting around the same time so that he wouldn't match up with them. But Drake is two plus C makes sense. Although he's on a, he's on a run. I think there's a lot of guys in here that he could fight. Uh, I'd like to see how he stacks up if he can make it against the um, standouts at middleweight. You know, our our standard contenders here in Paula Costa, Marvin Vittori, Derek Brunson, uh, that, that one being probably more likely. Uh, Sean Strickland, like I said, but eventually, because like I said, Sean, Sean Strickland is a, a bit of a jump right now, and he's the lowest ranking of all the people I just listed. Cool. Moving on. Uh, Dante Mays versus Augusto Sakai. I'll tell you. Uh, just a really quick sum up but um, overall in this fight. Dante Mays looks lost. I don't know what his deal is. I don't know if he deserves... Deserves is a strong word. I don't know... I don't know what his plans are. But if it's to stay in the UFC and to be a successful fighter, I feel that he, the stupid camera, uh, I really feel like he needs to change his mindset or something because he's clearly strong. He clearly hits hard. He does, he does a lot of good things, or he can do a lot of good things, sorry. But it feels like when he goes in there, he's just lost. And he doesn't know what he's doing. That's my overall takeaway of this from this fight, but. Let's break it down round by round. So Sakai landed a hard low kick to start. <laughs> Mays landed the best punches uh, early on, but then the low kicks from Sakai were really giving him issues. Sakai on the front headlock, and Mays doesn't reach down, doesn't drop to a knee, and just stays there and takes about 20 knees uh, to the head. Most of them were blocked by the hand or the forearm, so you know they didn't really land, but they're still doing some damage to the body, and it's just, it looks horrible. Sakai's kicks to the leg... Uh, kicked the leg out of Mays at one point. Sakai took the back for a second. I don't know if Mays knows what to do, to be honest. Uh, if you look at the significant strikes, it doesn't look like a huge gap. It only has Sakai up 19 to 13, but the total strikes should be a big difference. 
Nope. Apparently, Maze was able to do something. I, whatever. There's a almost nearly three minutes of control time for Sakai. Uh, do, do, do. Maze uh, looked really uncoordinated and confused. Maze was grabbing the gloves of Sakai. This is a theme. Uh, Sakai pressuring him against the cage. Maze grabbed the cage. <laughs> Sakai did a really great job just always doing something. Right? He's uh, always... He's always just st staying active, okay? He's throwing something out there. He's always moving around. Uh, this second round, Maze was just getting washed out. So I had a I had a, a Sakai up 20 to 18. You look at the striking numbers here. It's getting totally one-sided. 16 to 4 as far as significant strikes go. Total strikes 46 to 31. Uh, I don't think that tells the full story. Those 31 strikes, mu must, most of them were absolutely nothing. In this last round, Sakai working for an underhook, just consistently working. May is now grabbing the shorts. May switched his stance because his left leg is hurt, and even when they are in the open, it's just slop. Uh, May has grabbed the shorts again. Uh, at one point, he uh, was grabbing the gloves of Sakai. Uh, I don't know if I wrote that one down. Uh, I, dude, it's... Oh, yeah, and then the fight ends with Dantel Mays using the fence to stand up. <laughs> there's rules for a reason, whether you agree with him or not, you got to follow him while you're in there. And he just blatantly didn't, didn't care because all he would, they're just don't do that as he's doing it. Hey, don't do that one either. Hey, don't do that. Hey man, I said don't do that. And then the fight's over. So it like, what, what good are you? If all you're going to do is say, don't do that. None. Uh, last, last round uh, was 18 to 12 significant strikes in favor of Sakai. Uh, total washout. I gave it 30-27. Obviously, all three judges saw it the same way. So uh, I don't want to dwell on that one anymore. I don't want to really rag on the guy. I just feel like he, if he wanted to, he would. What? He has the. He's had this many fights in the. No, he did not have that many fights in the UFC. He's got the loss of Ciro gone. No shame in that. Rodrigo Nascimento. Okay, maybe no shame in that one either. Rogue Martinez, uh, or Roque Martinez, and Josh Parisian. Those are fine wins. You know, those are entry-level heavyweights, and he gets those. Hamdi Abdelham Wahab. I don't remember this fight, but apparently got overturned anyway. Ugh, dude, I don't know. I don't. I don't remember a lot of this stuff. He's a very forgettable fighter. I'll tell you that. Let's go to a happy note, shall we? Tatiana Suarez. Tatiana frickin' Suarez coming back after four years. Uh, her last fight was in 2019. She is undefeated and remains that way after getting the submission finish here. So Suarez was working for a takedown against the fence, got a single leg after a decent, some decent fighting from uh, Montana, to be honest. Uh, Montana De La Rosa, you know, she held her own. Uh, when she could, she was very strong, hard. Uh, obviously, Suarez, uh, you know, had to work very hard to get the positional advantages that she was working for. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of action in this first round outside of the grappling, especially against the cage. But Suarez got that one on my in my books. She had the control, landing the only strikes with advantage, in my opinion. Total strikes, they both threw eight. Tatiana landed seven to Montana's four. Obviously, Suarez wins that round. <laughs> Uh, Suarez was working for that takedown right away in the second round, using the headlock to get her down, land some elbows on the ground. Suarez jumps on a guillotine uh, with the arm and then pulls guard just to get the sub. Uh, geez, it was a great, great submission from her. I'm glad she got it and got the win. Uh, that submission finish is a big deal. Like I said, her last fight was back in 2019. She's undefeated in the UFC, undefeated overall, 10-0. Uh, her wins, like every single one of these on this list, is a real win. Amanda Cooper, Viviane uh, Pereira. Uh, by the way, this fight took place at 125. She is a 115er, so she's going to have to cut weight going back down. Shouldn't be an issue for her, but being such a long time out, she wanted to take her time and make sure that she didn't have any stupid complications uh, coming back after a, a while. She really wanted to get in there. That's what she said. Uh, she has a win over Alexa Grasso, who is fighting Valentina Shevchenko. Right, because Alexa Grasso is the best option there. Um, I mean, Grasso does have some good wins against uh, Calderwood or Wood, 
uh, Macy Barber and Viviane uh, Araujo. So she's got some good wins, but let's be honest here. Uh, Suarez is the better fighter of the two. Um, maybe uh, Grasso made, has made some bigger improvements since the last time they fought back in 2018. That is possible. But Tatiana Suarez also have a, has a win over Carla Esparza back in 2018. I understand that Esparza being champion doesn't necessarily mean Ta Tatiana Suarez would have been champion because I feel like Esparza did make improvements as well. But I do think she could be champion. Uh, given if she could have been champion over Esparza, absolutely. She's got a win over uh, Nina Nunes. Uh, formerly Nina Ansarov, obviously. So uh, that back in 2019, that win meant something that was before she had the baby, I believe. Right? Uh, yes, that's before she had the baby. Um, you know, this wasn't her get come back and get well. It was not a good get well fight. Uh, they punished her by giving her Mackenzie Dern. Uh, and then now Montana De La Rosa, who is a good fighter at 125, not a great fighter. Obviously, she's got wins over some uh, decent 125ers um, and Ariana Lipsky, but uh, she's got losses to Araujo, uh, Macy Barber, and now Tatiana Suarez. So that's rough for her. I mean, she had a win over Rachel Ostevich. You guys remember her? The answer is no. Please don't say you do. You don't. Um, let's see. I wouldn't be surprised if they threw her in the rankings, right, uh, for 115. I know she's been out for four years, but she was unde she's in undefeated, and she was in the top. I, I'm pretty sure she was in the top five, and, uh, you know, there, there was a good chance she was going to be challenging for a title in that whole mess that we had there. Uh, not a mess, that whole mix-up, or like the whole, uh, whatchamacallit, what do you want to call it? Carousel of 115 where they just, they're just going to exchange the belt between each other. And I wouldn't, I maybe give her one more fight before having her challenge it for a title. Absolutely. But uh, I, maybe two fights. If somebody else pokes their head out and becomes a clear challenger, someone with a big, a bigger name, someone with a better, uh, you know, a better resume, I guess. But the, here's the thing. It, it, her resume stands because when she beat those people, it was impressive at like at that time. I'm just a big fan. I, I am a big fan of Tatiana Suarez. I, I think she's amazing. I love her wrestling ability. It is next level. It She's very good. She's extremely strong. Uh, like her will is crazy. I, I was excited to see her. She was you know, running her way through the division, basically pegged to be the next uh, the champion at 115, and then, you know, she injured her neck. You know, she's also a cancer survivor. She's a former Olympic athlete, like Olympic, uh, Olympic hopeful. Like this woman has been put through the ringer over and over again, and constantly keeps coming back. Like, I don't know how you couldn't root for her. I, she's not, you know, she doesn't have a horrible, horrible personality. You know, like some of these guys out there do. She's not talking crazy, stupid shit. She's not saying negative things. She's not down talking or downplaying her opponent's abilities. You know, she just goes out there, does the damn thing, and talks about what she wants in the future and how lucky she is to be here. She is like, can that change? Obviously, but as of right now, I'm not. I don't know how you're not rooting for this woman unless you're her opponent or her opponent's family. All right, moving forward. This is the first fight on the main card. Mike Malott versus Johan Lanis. Uh, not a bad fight, uh, to be honest, Well, for w how long it lasted. Uh, Mike Malott is pretty damn good. <laughs> he is, man. Um, back and forth, they were landing about the same with Johan staying on the outside, both starting with leg kicks. Gotta love those leg kicks, guys. Uh, Lanis rushed in, <laughs> rushed in and then got wrapped up in a body lock, and uh, Mike ends up getting the takedown. Mike works for the arm triangle um, and then got the tap even before he got to the side. So normally when you get a uh, an arm triangle where you're you know, wrapping the other guy's head and arm like this, using your head and your arm around there, what you want to do 
is walk your body around, right? Like set, let's say their heads are up here. You want to walk your body like this, and that's going to create pressure on the carotid ar artery. Now, you can also get it from mount by just squeezing and then uh, leaning into it, which is what he was trying to do. And then right as he got off a mount and worked his way to the side, uh, that immediately uh, laid his tap. So he, that Mike Malott must have a crazy squeeze. This kid's pretty young, right? Uh, no, not really. What, 30, 31 probably. Yeah, I think he's 31. Anyway, I'm not doing the math on, I, like, yes, 31 should be it, or 30. You should be t thir turning 32 this year. Whatevs. Anyway, uh, his win over Mickey Gall, that's a fine win for whatever that is. Mickey Gall is a, you know, win-loss fighter in the UFC. He's actually a win-loss, loss, win-loss, loss, loss fighter. And Johan Lanus is a, again, he's a decent challenge for an entry-level fighter. And uh, Lanus, how is Lanus younger? He looks so much older than Mike Malott. Ugh. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Like, I'm not trying to be a shit on anybody. I'm just saying, like, if you were to look at both those guys. Here, let's see if I can pull a picture up of them. Dude. Can you guys see this? Just even off these pictures, who do you think looks older? You know what I'm saying? This guy. Or this guy. You know, I know he's got a young face, so that does kind of throw it off. But you know what I'm saying. Right? He's he's a year young. He's a, Mike Malott is a year older. <laughs> That's crazy. So weird to me. People people look so different. <laughs> I know that sounds stupid, but you know, just seeing faces, you can kind of like in your head just pick an age, and like, well, oh, that guy's probably this old based off of like how you look, and. I look at people and I can kind of guess their age a little bit, sort of like, hey, you look like you're in your 20, or mid 20s or early 20s or 30s or whatever. And then you look at someone and you're like, oh, you're probably in like your mid 20s. And it turns out they're in their 30s, like, oh, you know, he looks pretty young. And then vice versa, like, oh, dude, you look like you're in your mid to late 30s. Like, oh, I'm 24. Like, holy shit, bro. What happened in your life? Like, Gregory Rodriguez, that guy looks like he's in his like late 40s. And I think he's the same age as I am. I know I don't look the youngest anymore. Jeez whiz. Uh, some people just age different. You know, they have different facial structures. Um, this got off on a weird tangent, eh? <laughs> All right. Uh, that is it for the main card. I know this is relatively short, but that's because we had less fights. Uh, obviously, we had the main event fall out. That's uh, unfortunate. Uh, my, my best to uh, Nikita Krylov. I hope he gets better. Um, you know, he just came down with a sickness and not the disturbed kind. So, uh, I hope everybody has an amazing week. If you do like this kind of stuff, if you like MMA, you like podcasts, you like the fight breakdowns here, if you felt like you liked listening to me talk about this stuff, awesome. I appreciate it. Subscribe to the channel so you know the next video is coming out. I hope everybody has an amazing week. Um, you know, uh, If you're looking for the prelim video, that'll be the next one. Uh, if you're looking for Bellator, hopefully I get to that one. I'm really hoping I do. I'm sorry if I don't, guys. I preemptively apologize, but I'm really going to try and watch that. And then, obviously, I already had the 1FC video uh, with John Lineker. So uh, love y'all, love y'all, love y'all. Have an amazing week.